true. Um, broadly speaking, in the reading we've just heard, um, there's a little bit at the beginning that I want to focus on, and then there was a massive load of things that was, um, sounds like Paul's kind of correspondence about his friends. Uh, it's more than that, um, but I just want to focus on the first, uh, or on verses 2 to 6. Um, and as we focus on verses 2 to 6, um, you might like to look at the words in the Bible. Um, but the, the real um, two things that come out of this are an encouragement to pray, three things. Encouragement to pray, encouragement to be thankful, um, and then um, the way that we can use wisdom as we speak to people who are not Christians. So firstly, uh, devote yourselves, verse 2, to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. It's a recurring theme in Paul's letters. It's a recurring theme in probably almost every sermon you have ever heard. Devote yourselves to prayer. Um, praying is the easiest thing not to do when you're a Christian. Um, because we know we should. We know it's good for us. We feel good when we've done it. We see, we see results. We see that God answers prayers. But yet sometimes it can be hard to stop and to pray. I always uh, think of the certain people, uh, maybe you have people like this in your life too, and you'll have a conversation with them. And um, if they're Christians, um, maybe this has happened to you. And when they get bored of listening to you, go on about whatever issue it is that's bugging you, they'll say, why don't we just stop and take a moment to pray? Which is a really great and gracious way of saying, shut up. I'm bored of hearing you moan. Let's give it to God. Um, now, I don't want that to put you off. I'm aware that when I sometimes say something like this, I make a little remark at the front of church, and then people will feel they can't say to someone, let me pray for you without making them think they're being offensive. That's not my intention. Um, but just to say, sometimes it is good to stop and to pray. We can spend so long talking about an issue that bugs us. Um, and as the hymn says, uh, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So the watchfulness and the thankfulness go together. Sometimes in prayer, it involves silence. Some of you will have noticed that at the end of our time of sung worship this morning, I left a time of silence. That wasn't because I didn't know what to do. It might have been, but it wasn't. It was intentional. Because sometimes when we stop in prayer, we can hear what it is that God's saying to us. Sometimes it's just silence and we don't hear anything. But silence is an important part of prayer. That's what it can mean to be watchful. Because as we're watchful, we allow, for God, to we allow God to speak to us. And be thankful. It's very easy in prayer, I do this too, to come to God with a shopping list. To come with a shopping list. And once the prayer has been answered, I treat it, at my worst, like a shopping list. I don't know if you use a shopping list when you shop, but if you go around a store and you're buying the groceries you want to buy, then you, you cross them off on your list. Or if you have it on your phone, you tick it off. And then you forget about it because it's done. It's in your cart. It's in your basket. And yet Paul encourages us when we pray to be watchful and thankful. And the thankfulness piece means perhaps not crossing the prayer off the list so we can't see what it was, but maybe ticking the prayer off on the list so that we can remember to say, I can see that God answered that one in the way I was hoping. Or the way I wasn't hoping, but God answered. And so we're to be thankful as we pray. Paul writes verse 3, Pray for us too, that God may open the door for our message, so we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chain chains. Verse 4, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Paul is in prison. So in saying that the church should pray, He's also saying, can you pray for me that I may be released from prison 
so that I can do the work that I'm called to do. So devoting ourselves to prayer. Secondly, being wise in the way you act towards outsiders. What does wisdom mean? We've looked at the book of James uh, at some point recently, um, and in the book of James it talks about how we use the tongue. And one of the, um, it's one of the hardest things that we have in our body to control. Because either we say things we shouldn't, or, or we eat things we shouldn't. That's what the tongue does. If we control the tongue, uh, we'll probably look after our health in more ways than one. Uh, and so, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. This is general advice Paul's giving. Be wise. How can we be wise as Christians? He says, be wise, and there's a semicolon, make the most of every opportunity. So the, the wisdom that we're to have is a wisdom that makes the most of the opportunities that we have to share our faith. Let your conversation, verse 6, always be full of grace and seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. So I really want to focus uh, now on, on the grace and the salt. Um, I will explain the salt, but firstly, grace. We live in a society that prides itself on its ability to bring a comeback that is passive-aggressive. Am I wrong? Have you ever experienced a passive-aggressive response from somebody? Three people are nodding. Um, I think if we're honest, there's a lot of it about, if it's not passive-aggressivism, it's sarcasm. Uh, a lot of sarcasm. A lot more sarcasm in Britain than there is in Canada, I have to say. Um, and uh, it's why I can tell jokes with a straight face and no one laughs, because they can't tell if it's a joke or not. And, in, and I found when we visited England in the summer, um, and we had a train ticket. Um, I had to get trains in somehow. Um, we had a train ticket, and we went to a station, and I, I showed the guy the, the passes that we had paid a lot of money for to use the trains and to travel around. And uh, he says to me, it's not valid. Now, obviously, I knew that it was valid, and I knew that he was being sarcastic. But I thought, if I was a tourist from any other country who didn't know that this is how miserable some members of railway staff can be, um, <laughs> and, and how they would like to annoy the customers, um, I would probably get quite annoyed at that point. Um, so I just said, it is valid, and you knew that. All right, then he said, and he opened the gate and let me through, and, and let us all through into the station. Whether it's sarcasm or passive aggressivism or people just pulling our leg, those are the kinds of uh, ways we find that people can treat each other. What does it mean for our conversation always to be full of grace? It means even though our culture says it's so much fun to be sarcastic, it really is. It's so much fun to come back with a passive aggressive response. It's so much fun to huff under our breath quite loudly so that people hear when someone pushes in line in the store. It's so much fun when you're in Savon and they have that long line uh, now at the, one of the Savons, they have the middle one. I call it the middle one, it's the one uh, over there. Um, <laughs> there's three, aren't there? There's, the, there's one at that end of town, there's one over here, and there's one in the middle, so I call it the middle one. If I say the middle save on now, you know what I mean. Anyway, and, and, and someone will, uh, I'll have like one thing, and I'll see someone racing with their cart trying to get in front of me. It's so tempting to say something, isn't it? To say, it's fine, I'm not in a rush, you know? What does it mean for our conversations to be seasoned, to be full of grace and seasoned with salt? To be full of grace, we have an opportunity every day to practice grace. What does it look like for us to choose the way of grace? Now, Paul isn't writing about any conversation. He's specifically writing here um, about the way we perhaps have to talk when it comes to faith, but I think it can be applied to wider conversations. I think we want to be known as a church that's full of people who are full of grace. 
and our neighbors and our colleagues and the people we see in the street and our friends and our family will know we're full of grace by the words we use and the way we respond. And often that involves that really annoying thing of taking a breath and not answering straight away, even though we want to, of slowing down and thinking about how we can fill that conversation with a graceful response. And that response, too, Paul says, is to be seasoned with salt so that we may know how to answer everyone. Now, it's very easy to have an answer for any, everything. Um, I won't ask you to do a show of hands here because most people won't admit it, but a lot of us like to have an answer for everything, don't we? Um, I know I do. I love having an answer for everything. It's why I find Alpha is such a difficult thing to lead because my job in Alpha as a host is not to answer the questions because if I start answering the questions, I start imposing my view. I get to do that in a sermon, but at Alpha, I'm not allowed to do that. I have to sit there and when someone says something, say, that's really interesting. I wonder what other people think. I try and do the same in life groups. That's really interesting. What do other people think? Why? Because it allows the space for the conversation to happen. The knowing how to answer everyone is when you are at work tomorrow or at school tomorrow or at the club on Tuesday playing cards or wherever you might find yourself this week. Knowing how to answer people when they say, load of rubbish, this Jesus stuff, isn't it? What do we say to that? That kind of thing. How can we have a response that is gracious, that is not passive aggressive, that is helpful? I think that one of the things we can do is to realize that it's not all about now. The best sermons I preached were the first ones because I spent hours, and I mean hours, preparing them because I thought it was all about now. I would spend, because I would preach three times a year, I would spend a good kind of 18, 20, 30 hours working on this thing, honing it, making sure that I had um, alliteration in the three things they began with, so much time and effort in it. Um, but the difference between preaching three times a year and preaching every week, and the difference in being in a place as a one-off, as a student learning to preach, and being somewhere all the time, is that it's not about now. It's about last week, and the week before, and next week, and the week after, We'll be hanging out at Christmas and on New Year's Day. Hey, we got church on New Year's Day this year because of the way it falls. We'll be hanging out in Lent and Easter. And so it's not all about now. I don't have to give you every single theological answer to every question you have in 15 minutes today. Just hopefully enough to make you think it wasn't terribly boring and to come back next week. And I use myself as an example because it's easier than picking on anyone here. But if we apply that to each of us, and if I pick on you all for a second, forgive me, it's not about what you say to somebody when they say, ah, church is a load of rubbish, I can't believe you go. You don't have to explain the Trinity. You don't have to convince them of... of um, that the Apostles' Creed is all absolutely correct and they need to believe it today. It's okay to leave people with a sense of wonder. And I think that wonder and that, that ability to, to not have to answer everything now comes from having a confidence in our faith that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that confidence in our faith means we don't have to answer it all now. It's more important that we answer in a way that is full of grace and seasoned with salt. Not to get into arguments with people, but to bring the grace of God to the conversation. The grace of God is expressed in Jesus in the good news. 
Jesus who died on the cross so that we can be forgiven from all our sins. And so what does the seasoned with salt bit mean? Um, I, I once worked in a, in a store and there was a, a staff canteen. I don't know if you'd call it a canteen in Canada. Uh, kind of like a cafe um, for the staff in the back. And they served the stuff that they couldn't sell to the customers because it was out of date and horrible. And uh, no, it wasn't terrible, but it was often out of date. Um, and uh, I remember the first time I went in there and I ordered a burger and fries. Well, I actually ordered chips, but I'm translating. I ordered a burger and fries. Um, and, um, and there were some salt shakers on the table. And I don't tend to add salt to anything, it's bad for you, um, but I do add salt to fries. And so I got the salt shaker, and, uh, and, I, and I shook salt all over my fries. And then I started eating them. And I realized something terrible had happened. Something was terribly wrong. It wasn't salt at all. It was a sugar shaker. They'd put a sugar shaker, oh, that's hard to say, a sugar shaker on the table, and I'd put sugar all over my fries. And I tell you, sugar-coated fries are not nice. It destroys all the flavor. I forget exactly what happened after that. I think I just ate them. I don't think I then added salt afterwards, but I learned my lesson. Salt will bring out the flavor Whereas when we sugarcoat something, it doesn't always make it taste nicer. We don't need to sugarcoat the gospel, the truth of Jesus. Our words should be seasoned with salt. And the commentators say seasoned with salt, well, that probably means one of two things, and probably both of them, because we're Anglican, we'll take both, I think. Uh, so it means words that are wise. Use words that are wise. And also, um, the, the other explanation for salt is, um, is, the, is the one that you've heard before probably. Salt will um, preserve. Salt will enhance flavor. Um, if those fries had had salt on them, they would have tasted amazing. But because they had sugar on them, they really tasted quite terrible. Um, and um, I added ketchup, of course, which is full of sugar, too, so it just, it was just ruined, the whole thing. But anyway, our answers when we talk about faith, seasoned with salt and full of grace. Grace means we don't have to explain everything now. We don't have to give an answer for everything, but yet... We have to be ready to answer everyone. A lot of us, I think, end up saying nothing because we're afraid that if we start saying something, we'll say too much. We'll get ourselves into a hole where we then have to have some great long theological debate. So my encouragement would be, say something, but no that it's not all about today, in the context of eternity, uh, that there are other people who will get to share good news of Jesus with your friends, your family, uh, your co-workers, your school friends as well. And so what do we say to the person who says, I can't believe you go to church, that's a waste of time? You probably don't say, no, it isn't. You should try it. Maybe you say, that's really interesting. Why would you say it's a waste of time? And you listen. Let's be a community of people who are full of grace. Grace for each other. Grace for the world outside. That through our being graceful, through our willingness to engage in conversation without necessarily having all the answers, we may draw people to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us as a church community as we try to devote ourselves to prayer? Would you help us to be watchful and thankful? 
Would you open the door for our message that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ? Would you give us wisdom in the way we act towards others outside of the faith to make the most of every opportunity? Would you help us in our conversation to be full of grace with one another and others? And give us words to say that are seasoned with salt, that are wise, that are gracious, that are helpful. Lord, we thank you that you call us to be missionaries in this place. 